following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. Hello, listeners around the world on radio, streaming, and podcast services. This is It's Not Therapy. I'm Leanna Kersner, and I am not a therapist, but I am your source for navigating the madness of mental health using my top 10 sayings for checking in with your best self. This week, we're talking about being in a relationship with someone with a mental illness. Got an awesome guest this week, David T. Culkin, PhD, co-author of OCD in Marriage, Pathways to Reshaping Your Lives, will be here to talk to us later. David has OCD, and he co-wrote the book with his wife, Michaela, so that's going to be a great interview. But first, as usual, I set us up. Relationships are difficult to begin with. They're great, right? They're really rewarding, but they're difficult. Everyone has insecurities and personality quirks. We all bring our family of origin issues into adult relationships, and it becomes a big mess even before you include a mental health condition serious enough to warrant a diagnosis. As David will tell us later, not only are there very few supports for loved ones, of people with mental health challenges. Often the treatment becomes a gauntlet for caregivers where the caregiver begins to believe their needs don't matter. And then they begin to resent their loved one as they become increasingly drained. The concept of support. Well, this is where I'm a big believer that words mean things. Support involves enough structure for someone to feel secure without squeezing so tightly that you strangle them. Supporting someone with a mental health challenge doesn't mean that you let them do anything they want or treat their whims like the word of God. It means learning about and understanding their condition and working with them to develop a system of trust that makes everyone feel like they matter. And I know, that's wishy-washy, airy-fairy language. I'll break it down. Questions, comments, concerns, a lot to get into. We do not have enough time in 40-some-odd minutes and commercials for all of this. This is scratching the surface. Leanna at nottherapyshow.com. If you want to reach out for additional information, nottherapyshow.com, or join our mailing list at nottherapyshow on X, that's Twitter, Instagram, and threads. Okay, my support methods, again, providing structure, not squeezing to strangle. I don't do hug boxes. I do not create safe spaces. I am not and never have been a believer in safe spaces. I create supportive spaces when I do my groups. Supportive spaces mean checking people on their, I have to say ish, on radio, but giving them space and encouragement to improve. That means, you know, not one mistake, you're out. We check people on mistakes, but we give them a great many chances to turn it around. Supportive spaces encourage people to take risks with the awareness that they may fail. And if they fail, there's a game plan for what happens if they do. Seems simple, right? But it takes a lot of work and a lot of checking in to maintain. Supportive spaces don't allow a mental illness to dominate everyone's lives. Supportive spaces do recognize that a person with a mental illness cannot be expected to act like they don't have a mental illness. I See, so often the people around somebody with a mental health condition suddenly just expecting someone in a moment of crisis to not have OCD or not have BPD or not have, you know, AVPD, lesser known one, avoidant personality disorder. If someone's really struggling, supportive spaces are there to listen. But if someone starts making excuses... A supportive space doesn't let them get away with that. A supportive space points out the bad behavior in a respectful way, not only to help the person improve, but so that everyone in the space feels like they matter and don't have to just take 
punch after punch or eat a lot of, I have to say, ish on the radio. (laughs) And this is where we get to the shocking truth. Not all people with mental health challenges are, to borrow from South Park, stunning and brave. Some mentally ill people are good people. Some are horrible jerks. Because people with mental illnesses are, wait for it, people. I repeat, people with mental illnesses are people. And... When you deal with the mental health system enough, you you do have to repeat that because the mental health system tends to deperson the mentally ill. In doing so, that depersons their entire family, their friends, their loved ones who have to deal with the therapy induced trauma from being depersoned. Your mentally ill loved one is not just a bundle of symptoms. Furthermore, a person who's depressed or has anxiety, well, they're still capable of telling right from wrong and for the most part accurately relating their experience, having some assumption and judgments about something that don't quite track doesn't mean they can't tell you if you slow it down what exactly was said, the order that things happened in, Somebody getting a diagnosis doesn't take away their right to be an, you know, accurate narrator of their own story. You know, top 10 phrase, be the hero of your own story and not anyone else's. People who have been in treatment for a while, even people with personality disorders, I I don't like that term. People with severe mental health struggles are, for the most part, in touch with reality. And you can believe them when they say something is legitimately hurting them. That person you're talking to at work is not likely experiencing active psychosis. They can tell reality. It's amazing we have to break it down this this basically. But it's interesting how many people the minute there's a diagnosis oh they don't know they don't know what they want they don't know what happened to them I have to tell them I have to save them I have to protect them no within the last week I've gotten again the some people are just triggered by everything dismissal when I told someone they should respect trauma triggers ah that person doesn't know everything just upsets them there's a reason one of my top 10 phrases is people don't have to like your boundaries but they do have to respect them for those in the back if you think someone is triggered by everything well either that's a sign of a serious problem or you don't think the person is being honest. So be honest with yourself. If you think somebody's a liar, don't talk to them. Avoid them. You have that right to set that boundary regarding their access to you. But ignoring or mocking a boundary, a stated boundary, nope, that's wrong. I repeat, that's wrong on no planet is that right. When you do that, You're bullying. No one likes being told no. I don't like being told no. I don't like being told I'm not allowed to do something. I get cranky and grumpy about it. But non-abusive people don't just ignore no, stop, and don't. I may be frustrated by a restriction someone puts on a conversation, but I don't just go no too bad and gleefully do exactly the thing I know they don't like. Unfortunately, a lot of people come from families where that behavior I just described, that was normal. And it's hard to understand another way of doing things when you've been trained by a family who stomped boundaries gleefully. Other families, they they may not gleefully hurt each other. Oh, no, it's just toughing them up. It's just they have to learn to take it, right? Life is hard. No, other families function based on shame dynamics or a combination of both. The primary motivator in families driven by shame is other people not finding out about the illness. 
as opposed to the priority being helping the person overcome the illness. People in those families aren't going to get better because shame keeps you stuck. Then there are the toxic families I might dislike the most. The families that make another person's illness about them. Someone recently told me about a funeral they went to where the deceased son announced that his father had OCD. Except the father didn't have OCD. He'd never been diagnosed with OCD. He probably had an anxiety condition, but he'd never been formally diagnosed with that either. The guy was just nervous and liked things neat. No one was aware there was no evidence of any intrusive thoughts, obsessions that required relief via performing repetitive behaviors or rituals. That's the obsessive and compulsive part of the disorder. Somebody just being picky isn't OCD. And yet, this guy's son, at his funeral, announced to everyone there that his dad had OCD that he didn't have. That, don't do that. Don't diagnose a family member just because you find them a certain kind of annoying. Doing this self-diagnosing or family diagnosing perpetuates mental health stigma and makes people think out there that they understand conditions that they don't actually have the first clue about. And a shocking number of the people I work with have family members who are who were social workers or addiction counselors or something like that and they used that to abusively leverage that authority when even they shouldn't have been diagnosing their own family don't diagnose family it's a bad idea don't do it this is it's not therapy that's what therapy is for therapy is for the diagnosis i'm here for other stuff Now, there's an associated group of people, this bunch I've taken to calling the everything is trauma club. Bipolar, actually trauma. BPD, secretly just trauma. OCD, just trauma, trauma, trauma. No. No, these conditions are not just PTSD. They're not. I have PTSD. This is not the same as my friends with bipolar 1 or 2, borderline personality disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, or any of the very, very, very serious things that they have. This everything is trauma is the new vaccines cause autism. And no, vaccines don't cause autism. Autism is not a disease that can be injected into someone. I can't believe we still have to say this, but we do. Many personality disorders are rooted in childhood neglect not trauma. Someone with a trauma condition here, I'd really strongly caution against trying to pressure a family member into the idea that they're traumatized. Trauma robs us of a sense of control. And by demanding that someone confess their trauma, you're making that worse, not better. If you're too pushy, someone is less likely to tell you the stuff that they're really scared of. And I know you mean well. I know you feel like you've had a big breakthrough, a big epiphany. Oh my God, that's trauma. But be the hero of your own story, not anyone else's. You having trauma doesn't mean you get to tell somebody else that they have trauma. It's their trauma. It's their story. They're the hero of their own story, not you. Because if you take a good hard look at that kind of pushing people into confessing trauma, that railroading behavior. I mean, really take a good look in the mirror there because you're better now, right? You can do it. You're trying to control the other person there and that's still acting through your trauma. And I'm sure you have good reasons for pushing. Yeah, the best reasons. You're sick of the person destroying your collective lives, but that doesn't mean you can still do it. Don't push people to confess trauma. There is a huge difference between setting a boundary for what behavior you'll tolerate and attempting to coerce someone into doing what you want them to do. 
it can be very difficult not to cross that line when someone is doing something truly self-destructive. But unless there's an agreement in advance that you're the person who can decide action needs to be taken, it's just not something one respectful adult does to another adult or even, frankly, a child in a lot of cases. Any therapist can tell you the damage that comes from parents berating their children, shaming them, and even physically forcing them to conform, sometimes to the point of injury. And there's a uniquely delicate balance with men in this area. I work primarily with men. And some of the things I've found, you know, one thing that's really helpful, for instance, the no pity zone. You, listener, might feel reassured by someone saying, I'm so sorry that happened to you. But a lot of guys, oh, they can't stand it. And you immediately, oh, I'm so sorry. They will clam up. That is what they don't want. And I know you're trying to help, but rule of thumb, it's not helping unless the person is helped by it. This is otherwise known as a top 10 phrase. Don't let problems that aren't your fault lead to mistakes that are. Your loved one's mental health struggle is your problem too. But trying to force them into a treatment that they don't want is only going to drive them away and make them not trust you. All you can do is indicate that you're not going to stick around while they behave badly due to their mental illness. Set those boundaries. Because similarly, their mental illness is a problem that isn't their fault. But when they use that mental health condition as an excuse for bad behavior, that's a mistake that is their fault. Don't let problems that aren't your fault lead to mistakes that are. I'll talk more about that after we talk to our guest because I want you to hear this stuff from him. David T. Culkin, PhD, will join us after the break. David and his wife, Michaela, are the co-authors of OCD and Marriage, Pathways to Reshaping Your Lives. David is the one with OCD in the marriage. We'll be talking to him after the break. Questions, concerns, comments, Leanna at nottherapyshow.com or go to the website, uh, nottherapyshow.com. Fill out the contact form where you're there or join the mailing list, Not Therapy Show on X, Twitter, Instagram, and threads. Back with more on mental illness and relationships on It's Not Therapy. The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on this therapy. I'm still Leanna Kirsner. I'm still not a therapist. We're still talking mental health and relationships, how your partner's struggles can affect you as well. And I'm here with a great guest, David T. Calkin, PhD. David's written a book called OCD and Marriage. And unlike you know, many of the guests we've had on lately, David himself has OCD. So David, thank you so much for coming on It's Not Therapy. I understand that I have to do a disclaimer uh to to appease your employer that these are just your personal opinions they are not professional they do not reflect your workplace at all we which will we not mention did i do that right i appreciate it yes all right so you and your your wife wrote a book called ocd and marriage correct correct yes. yeah and i'll i'll do the cheesy opener what made you decide to write this book well well thank you for having me uh liana uh really the uh it came down to uh, we had struggled with OCD through uh, not knowing what it is to diagnosis and treatment uh, over a course of about 20 years. But we found plenty of resources for people like me who actually had a diagnosis, mm-hmm. could take medication and get therapy, but very little for someone like my wife who is uh, trying to know and learn about how not to facilitate my obsessions and compulsions, how not to uh, go nuts when dealing with someone like me who, you know, has particular ways of doing certain things uh, out of fear. And so uh, we wrote this book to really uh, have people who are other people who are in our positions not go through the same pain. And so uh, we wrote it to help as many people as we can. 
Yeah, that's a really good point when you talk about caregiver stuff. It's a it's a rough go, right? I mean, not to say that having OCD isn't rough. OCD's brutal. We've dealt we've had people with OCD on the show before. But right. the you're right. The lack of caregiver supports is a real thing and I noticed you focused on facilitating uh not support, not supporting the person, but actually Putting boundaries there. Did I get that right? That that's what you're talking about there? That's a great way of putting it, Liana. I mean, it's really important for the person who is uh, who is does not have uh, the disorder to really understand the disorder and know what the limitations are and realize when they're facilitating and when they're not. And those boundaries are really critical. Yeah. And uh, boundaries are one of these things I'm finding is really poorly understood. It's not about making the other person do something. It's telling people, here's my line. I'm not going to accept this. I will accept this. And sometimes it's just a question of, I understand you're going through a difficult time. You know, these are behaviors I won't accept. So how did you and um, and your wife navigate that with, with it sounds like very little help. Michaela and I really approach this like we would any other complex problem or issue in our relationship. And that is have a discussion, be honest with each other, and uh, really come to a conclusion what needs to happen, and then identify the compromises each of us would have to make. And so it took me years, for example, to uh, to trust that when she said, you're doing it, meaning hey, you're in the middle of a cycle of obsession compulsion, uh, that uh, I would trust her that I could stop mm. and uh, stop it. That's really difficult. It's like stopping a sneeze. Yeah. Um, and so you, it really takes an amount, a tremendous amount of uh, working together to do that. Uh, so one way we did that was uh, just developing, we call it a bank of civility. And that is you you treat someone like you would always treat or be tr like to be treated. Uh, we all we all know the golden rule, mm -hmm. but uh, it's really focusing on it and com being committed to it, treating someone with respect, don't not using uh, expletives, saying thank you, mm. I love you, and mean it, and really mean it. And uh, what that does is over time, it adds to your bank. It it provides a foundation of trust, and that really that really has helped, especially when we've been in the doldrums or in tough circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's it. A lot of people that I've mentioned that things like "I love you," things like "Thank you" mean so much. But then I get a response of, "Well, I'm mad at them. Why would I say that?" And I I get stopped dead by that question, because I know there are some people who are raised in families that didn't have that example. How do you tackle that uh, resistance to that vulnerability in tough moments? I think we realize, especially with OCD and any other, I think, mental disorder, that while all relationships uh, have tough times, when you have, when you're living with a mental disorder under your roof, you practically come to an abyss, the edge of an abyss, almost every time you have that that tough conversation. Mm -hmm. But yet, while you have the com tough conversation, it gets you away from that. And so that honesty and truthfulness is really important. Um, and so really just talking to each other and having that trust, that's really key. Now, you talk about self-compassion in your writing a lot. And when you do, you know, describing it as an abyss, that's very true. Sometimes we slip into that abyss and we are not ourselves, do things we regret. And I've worked with some people who say, I don't deserve love. I don't deserve a partner because I've I've got these problems, because I've done all these bad things. How do you navigate the reality that i mean ocd is a tough hand and sometimes it it does get the better of you how do you be compassionate with yourself so that you can feel deserving of love and companionship very important question liana um when i was growing up and, and then i ultimately realized i had ocd by the time i was like 26 mm -hmm. um 
it was an identity crisis that I had because why would I have all of these intrusive thoughts about violence, uh, sexual taboos, whatever it may be, things that are not acceptable in society? Why would I be having these thoughts? And I could only conclude that I must be a bad person. I right. must, be, you know, and so, uh, and then once I got married and we started uh, really having uh, a, a really firm relationship, you know, it, it just continues. But we had that discussion of love is a choice. If you look, you just go back and all the tr faith traditions out there, love is really a choice. And so it's a commitment. And it's different than liking someone. Mm -hmm. I may be ticked off at you at the moment and having a big argument, and you're not my favorite person, but I will love you. So mm -hmm. there's an under, there's a deeper issue with love, that agape love that uh, the Greeks talked about, versus I'm mad at you, therefore I can't talk to you and, mm -hmm. and so forth. That's very different. And so we we made that. Uh, decision early on that hey we're gonna we love each other regardless but it's liking each other yeah you're not my favorite person right, right. now because you're cycling uh or you're facilitating me that's really important but uh, that identity piece was critical and one day my wife said you know you worry all the time about having these crazy thoughts and if you would act upon them but there are plenty of people out there who don't even think twice about doing these things Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, good point. Yeah. You got to give yourself some credit for what you do do. Yeah. 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 You, you also talk in your articles about the I thou point of view. And this is one of those things with, with people who love somebody with a mental health struggle, they do become, as you said, um, an object without a voice in the whole treatment protocol. It all becomes a, about supporting the person in therapy as opposed to treating the family like a unit where everyone's affected. Uh, how, obviously that's going to have a real, it, it's going to have an impact on the partner and there's some climbing back from that that had to happen. How did you guys tackle that element? I think the first thing we did was decide that we are going to be committed to this. And we decided we both wanted to be involved in the therapy. And, and so that wasn't a problem, but I know that's a problem for a lot of couples mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that can b b really mean uh, a challenge, but uh, it took years to find the right therapist. That's really the other point. Yeah. Find the right person. Not all therapists are alike. And I'm not saying quality wise, but just experience with, in my case, OCD, mm -hmm. because uh, there there are specific uh, attributes to look for. There are certain things to consider in a relationship, in a family situation, dealing with these particular disorders. So finding the right therapist is critical. When we did find the right therapist, we, she was the one who diagnosed me within mm -hmm. a couple of minutes. But we were in the same room together, Mikhail and I. And so we we uh, were dealing with it and we physically were dealing with it from the outset. That was critical. And so my agreeing to continue those sessions, sometimes alone, sometimes mm -hmm. with Michaela, were very important. Uh, but we also, like you said, established uh, uh, lines so, for example, when I was going through ex exposure response and prevention therapy, I would tape uh, some of my social taboos and intrusive thoughts out loud on my on a recorder, mm -hmm. and I would just go through that script repeatedly over a course of several months, mm -hmm. and that caused stress, that caused yeah, that's strain, exhausting. But, yeah. but yeah. over time, it winnowed down, but we agreed that she would never come down and listen or look at the scripts. So that was her boundary to keep her satisfied that I was doing it, but she didn't have to be involved in the details. Nobody comes into a relationship totally mentally perfect, right? Everybody has um, insecurities. Everybody has weak points. And when your partner is suffering, all it starts to feel like your fault. 
what's your or or you're inadequate you're not good enough and that's why they've got this issue which is completely illogical because you know you came into the relationship with it it predated her she didn't cause it but what's your advice for each individual in the relationship owning their part without taking on too much blame yeah that's also important um i think the first thing as a couple is to realize this is serious. This needs to be addressed. So ignoring it or hoping it'll go away or whatever, just not addressing it mm -hmm. uh, is, is, not, is not the answer. It's only going to get worse and fester. Uh, second of all, uh, from the, uh, for the person with a disorder, uh, acknowledging that the other person has your best interests at heart and building that trust over time in conjunction with agreeing to go to therapy, agreeing to take medication if that's involved in the treatment and, and, and not backing down, especially when you think progress is not being made. So I can't, I can't tell you how many times people have just given up because they thought it was too hard and they ran into a rock, a wall at the beginning and didn't stick with it. Uh, for the person without the disorder, but is pr providing that support, uh, again, like any other uh, serious issue in your relationship, take it seriously. Recognize that this person loves you but needs some support and that it's not you uh, and that you can help the person hold their hand, if you will, going through the process, mm -hmm. but also demanding that the person gets help. And sometimes that involves you in the room with the therapist. Sometimes it doesn't. And it, that's that's an important discussion to have uh, with your partner. All right, David, hang on. We need to go to a break. David T. Culkin, PhD, co-author with his wife, Michaela, of OCD and Marriage Pathways to Reshaping Your Lives. We're going to take a break. More on OCD and marriage after the break. The following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on Insta Therapy. I'm still Leanna Kersner. I'm still not a therapist. I'm still talking to David T. Culkin, PhD. David and his wife, Michaela, co-authored OCD and Marriage Pathways to Reshaping their li Your Lives. David has OCD. His wife, Michaela, and him wrote a book together. And before the break, we were, I mean, we we're talking about a lot of stuff. We got through a lot. But one, you mentioned support. And in a healthy marriage or any long-term relationship, support has to go both ways. And I think a lot of uh, partners don't want to burden the person with the diagnosis in their struggle. And that just that just makes a person with a diagnosis feel less, right? Oh, I'm so broken that she can't come to me. How did you guys navigate that? That yes, you do have this thing that you're dealing with and you need support, but you also want to be a source of support for her. Yes, you're right. Uh, hard to see when you have a disorder and you're dealing with this thing and until you get diagnosed and then you realize, okay, this is what I'm up against. Now let's get together and fight it together. Mm -hmm. That that takes a while to do. Um, but I would say it, it, it's funny because you mentioned this because uh, in one of the initial therapy sessions we had, so this is about the seventh year of our marriage, um, my wife turned to me and she said, you're so broken. You know, in mm -hmm. other words, I didn't realize you had this, you know, I, I could have probably made a different choice if mm -hmm. uh, I knew about this. Um, and so learning together about what this had, you know, this, mm -hmm. this challenge with my brain uh, was, was really important. Um, providing support then for her uh, meant, took years longer for me than it did her. And I think because I was in it, it's hard to see outside of your little bubble uh, mm -hmm. when you're, when you have the disorder, but agreeing, trusting her that, hey, yeah, I need this help. I need this time alone or what have you. Really important to establish that pattern of, of life and behaviors that will help your partner rejuvenate and to uh, recover 
uh, because they need it just as much as you do mm -hmm. with the disorder. Um, and then allowing uh, her to, in my case, to provide that support and to uh, really believe her when she says you're doing it or whatever, you know, safety word you want to do if you're cycling, for example, in public and you don't want to draw attention to yourself. Uh, so, uh, I, in fact, one uh, a couple we met, uh, they, their safety word was Saskatchewan. So I thought that was... <laughs> Wow, how can you fit that into a sentence? Uh, I'm Canadian, so it's a little yeah, different Yeah, exactly. Up here. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's great. So we thought that was great. But, uh, yeah. and th so it, and also talking with other couples, uh, it depends. It can help, but it may not. Uh, so uh, we went to a couple of, for example, uh, uh, working groups, discussion mm -hmm. groups, and uh, the people there were in a different place than we were. Uh, education wise in terms of where we were and uh, uh, our our jobs and uh, our responsibilities, just very different and our ability to function. And so there was, uh, it really didn't help us. And, and uh, so we had to keep searching until we found something that works. So, uh, and everyone's different. Uh, and that's why we, we use, we uh, resorted to the uh, the International Organization for uh, Obsessive Compulsive uh, Disorders, the foundation, IOCDF, and it really provides some resources, local chapters, et cetera, conferences uh, that we can really tap into. And But again, for the first 10 years uh, of knowing about that organization, the focus is like most uh, disorder organizations focus on the therapy, the therapists, and the people with the disorder mm -hmm. and only now starting to come around to really supporting the rest of the family. Um, the, the trust accountability cycle that you're describing here. It's so, it's so powerful in that, you know, you trust Michaela to say you're doing it and you don't get defensive about that you guys have that bond you have that understanding that she's not doing it to control you she's doing it because you know you don't you don't want to embarrass yourself any more than you i assume that's that's why you want to do it right you you want to catch it when she can see it and you can't that correct yeah that takes a ton of work as a couple that takes putting a lot of, you know, the pre relationship stuff of, Oh, I, you know, can't trust anybody or you're just trying to control me or the, the shame reaction of I'm embarrassed. So I don't want to admit I did it. So I'm just going to deflect and project, you know, lash out and pick apart the way the person said it or the tone they used. There are so many points here where just good old negative feelings can get in the way of this very effective system. So how do you guys keep this very, very, you know, finely tuned engine running this way? It's kind of amazing. Uh, very important question too. Um, first of all, I would say we're, we're not, in, we're not perfect in terms of just because we wrote a, we've written a book and, uh, uh, we've talked about this publicly, doesn't mean that we've figured it all out or mm -hmm. that we don't have uh, uh, regressions uh, now and then. Uh, mm -hmm. We certainly do. And there's certain times when uh, what I've found is I resort to, I call them ruts or mental ruts, mm -hmm. where I, I go back to almost 15, 20 years of how I was thinking then when I was in the middle of a, a possession compulsion and just um, and just lashing out. And that can usually come with times when you're stressed, mm -hmm. you're tired, uh, et cetera. So uh, being aware of that is important. Um, and then that defensiveness is, a, some, we both recognize that we're better than this when we're in those ruts, but we also recognize you have to, uh, you know, you have to give yourself some grace, we call mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. self, that self-compassion may mean taking time off or mm -hmm. time out. You go to your room, you just kind of relax and then not talk about it for a while. And then coming back when, you, when you're both in a position where you can talk, when it's, uh, it's comfortable, 
uh, have that talk, have that talk that you want to really do, but the pride and the ego and all that stuff get in the way. Uh, and to really solve that problem of, hey, and, and normally the conversation goes something like this. It's like, hey, we're better than this. I know you, I can understand well, you were frustrated, Dave, about uh, these things. I know you were tired and you were, uh, certain things trigger you. Uh, what's, let's say, a loud public uh, 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 environment, for mm -hmm. example, I can go crazy. And then uh, and from my side, it's, Yes, you're right. I should have listened to you and trusted you when you said you're doing it. I I agree that I was thinking like I was 15 years ago and and just throwing out uh, kind of mean spirited uh, darts at you, and that mm -hmm. that was not fair. So just acknowledging that, being honest with each other, having that conversation, and again, you go going back to what you were saying before. Really important to realize you both love each other you're doing this, this conversation because you love each other. You mm -hmm. may not like each other, but the real reason you're sitting there and taking a time and making the effort is because of that love. Mm -hmm. Final pointers for feeling in control, but also comfortable enough to plan things before you take the leaps as opposed to making the person, you know, constantly play catch up. Yep. Uh, I would say, again, as a couple uh, and, and and maybe as a family, depends on, you know, how old everyone is mm -hmm. to really have that discussion early on, especially once you have the diagnosis. Before the diagnosis, it's, it's a dark time because you don't know what you're up against and you're, you're only surmising that maybe it's just me. I'm just screwed up and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm imperfect and I'm really a bad person. So that's a more existential type of challenge. Uh, but just having that conversation and realizing that this is a challenge that we're facing as a family, as a couple, just like anything else. And so we do have to sit down, we have to communicate and and make that agreement up front. Uh, and I think the other thing is uh, that willingness to get help, to to agree that, yeah, I'm I need some help here, professional help. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be I'm going to open myself to it. Some people have a challenge with that, mm -hmm. and uh, that can be a problem as well. Uh, and then finally, I think uh, finding the right therapist. Again, in OCD, um, you're looking for someone who has experience in administering exposure and response prevention, uh, call it ERP for short, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then also access to a uh, someone who can prescribe medication if that's what you need in conjunction with cognitive behavior therapy. So it's just a matter of knowing what is, what's out there, what you're up against, and, and having that commitment to use those tools that are available to you to address it. David Culkin, David T. Culkin, author, co-author of OCD and Marriage Pathways to Reshaping Your Lives with his wife, Michaela. Uh, David, I envy the organization of your thoughts. I wish I could speak so organized. Thank you so much for coming on It's Not Therapy and sharing your, your knowledge, but also your experiences. It's greatly appreciated. Thanks, Liana. It's been a pleasure. Anywhere other than Psychology Today and your book that people can... Uh, uh, find out what you're doing, contact you maybe for some additional suggestions? Yeah, the, I, I think the, the best way to, uh, to is uh, the psychology today uh, is really an ex a blog is an extension of the book. Um, reading the book will give you kind of a, an exposure to our journey. And that's important. And most importantly is uh, hooking up with um, a, an organization that's organized for your disorder, whether it's OCD mm -hmm. or some others. And uh, that's where you can get those resources, especially locally. Um, and then, you know, uh, uh, david.t.colkin at gmail.com. Uh, you know, I'm always willing to talk to folks who uh, there are plenty of people out there who, like us, are writing about their experiences, talking about their experiences, because the bottom line is you're not alone. And when you realize that, it, it changes your world. All right, David Culkin, check him out. Check out him and his wife, Michaela. Uh, we're going to be back with final thoughts after the break. I'm going to collect myself because that was a lot of information. My brain is like overheating on 
relationships and mental health, mental health conditions and the impact on relationships. We'll be back soon on It's Not Therapy. We're back on It's Not Therapy. I'm still Anna Kersner. I'm still not a therapist. We've only got about three minutes left in this show about relationships and mental health. And so very quickly, I want to go back to that idea of uh, facilitation and partners mattering, friends mattering, families mattering when it comes to battling a mental health condition. And again, I've been going back to my top 10 phrase, uh, don't let problems that aren't your fault lead to mistakes that are. Uh, I talk quite a bit on this show about how I live with post-traumatic stress. Dis- post-traumatic stress, I don't say disorder for the most part because I am mostly asymptomatic these days, but that's because I do the work and there's too many situations where a mental health condition wreaks havoc on an entire family. And I want to speak to that and my own process of not allowing the people around me to facilitate me, as David mentioned. And that's where don't let problems that aren't your fault lead to mistakes that are comes in. A mental health condition is not a blank check. And I can be very, very strict. I can be very, very rigid on certain elements of my mental health day to day. And I explain it this way. When I stick to my practice, when I do what I'm supposed to do, I'm good crazy. When I let my boundaries slip, when I let people walk all over me, when I return to the old bad habits, then I become bad crazy. And I don't want that. I don't want to be that person. I want to be this person. So I may be difficult in the short term, but in the long term, it's a lot better than the alternative. And the people who have stayed in my life mostly understand that. It can be difficult sometimes. The people that didn't understand that and criticized me and put me down for having those things that are necessary for me to stay good crazy instead of bad crazy, well, they had to go. And that can happen sometimes in relationships. And it's hard and it's painful and you do have to grieve it. But, you know, it's your choice. Do you want to let problems that aren't your fault lead to mistakes that are? And sometimes having certain people in your life who are good people but not good for you is one of those mistakes that are your fault. And that's tough. That can be a part of our trauma, but it's a necessary part of the recovery process of the healing process. And the most important stages are often the most painful. And unfortunately, I am out of time for this show. Leanna at nottherapyshow.com is my email. Nottherapyshow.com is my website. Join the mailing list while you're there on social media at nottherapyshow.com. Until next time. Your crazy is only a problem if it's hurting you.